This is David Orenstein speaking now. I want to welcome everybody in attendance today. I want to thank George for graciously agreeing to be our speaker for Darwin Day, which is actually Wallace Day <laughs> for today, because we really should not forget about the incredible, important uh, contributions of Alfred Jeffrey Wallace. Um, it's wonderful to know that um, uh, a relative of uh, uh, Wallace is here, and uh, we have to tell you how much we respect uh, your great grandfather's work. Let me just also thank uh, the Board of Secular Human Society of New York, uh, as well as our co sponsoring organizations, New York City Atheist and CFI New York, uh, Lawrence and uh, Ken, if you're uh, here in the meeting now. Um, again, I want to thank you for your graciousness as well. Uh, because even though we might come at free thought and secularism from various different views, um, we are all one happy family, even though we're somewhat speciated. If I can say just a few kind words about Secular Human Society of New York, it's one of the oldest and proudest uh, secular humanist organizations in New York City. Uh, we have uh, various uh, programs throughout the year. We have Zoom meetings throughout the uh, uh, once a month. Uh, we have book clubs. Um, and, you know, we're a, um, a group who are dedicated to not only seeing secular humanism grow in New York, but in the United States and see it um, be a global phenomenon around the world. Allow me to introduce our speaker. Uh, George, uh, Dr. George Bellaconi is a zoologist, evolutionary biologist, taxonomist, museum curator, and science historian. Uh, he's worked uh, for London's Natural History Museum as an entomologist for more than two decades. Uh, he set up the Wallace Memorial Fund in 1999 and is the founding director of the Wallace Correspondence Project. In 2002, George played a critical role in helping uh, the museum acquire the world's largest collection of Wallace-related manuscripts um, and articles, um, mainly from Wallace's descendants. So kudos to Wallace's descendants as well. He has published, uh, George has published in uh, numerous um, uh, journals and articles about Wallace and has co-edited the book, Natural Selection and Beyond, The Intellectual Legacy of Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, co-authored with Charles Smith. Uh, George is um, uh, known to, be, to give numerous talks about Wallace and has traveled widely uh, retracing the steps of Wallace in the Malay Archipelago. Uh, he is a consultant, uh, a historical consultant and has worked on many uh, BBC science themed programs um, about Wallace. So uh, for the man who uh, needs little introduction but has just gotten one, I turn the meeting over to uh, Dr. Uh, Beccaloni and uh, welcome. Thank you very much, David. And um, thank you um, all for coming today. Um, so uh, I won't say anything more about myself. Um, and I'm sure uh, probably all of you already know that the theory of evolution by natural selection uh, was jointly published by Darwin and Wallace. But uh, very few actually know the story of how this came about. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, without Wallace, Darwin may never have published the theory of natural selection and he certainly wouldn't have published Origin of Species. If anything, he would have published a very dull, multi-volumed technical work, which very few people would have probably ever read. So uh, let's begin. Although Wallace is not exactly a household name these days, he was probably the most famous scientist in the world when he died in 1913, age 90. During his long life, he wrote more than a thousand articles and 22 books on a very wide range of subjects. And in these, he made many very important contributions to a very diverse range of fields, including 
biology, geography, geology, anthropology, and even um, astrobiology, the study of life on other planets. His best known scientific books are The Geographical Distribution of Animals, Island Life, and an excellent book about evolution, which he generously entitled Darwinism. His most famous book is, however, his uh, travel log uh, called The Malay Archipelago, which is apparently uh, Joseph Conrad's favorite bedside reading, and which hasn't been out of print since it was published um, in 1869. Wallace's single most important scientific discovery was, of course, natural selection, which many people still think originated in Darwin's book, Origin of Species. However, Wallace's contributions to biology went far beyond merely co-discovering the theory um, on which the modern subject is based. Unlike Darwin, he always rejected Lamarckism, which is the inheritance of characteristics acquired during the life of a parent. For example, the enlarged biceps developed by a blacksmith um, during the course of his career. In fact, Wallace was the first natural selectionist um, to reject this false theory, and he was therefore, in fact, ironically, the first neo-Darwinian. Wallace devised the first modern definition of what species are, a slightly modified version of which would later become known as the biological species concept. Darwin didn't actually define what a species was in Origin of Species, um, bizarrely. In addition, Wallace believed that speciation largely occurs in allopatry or parapatry, where um, diverging populations are geographically separated, which is um, allopatry, or abutting, which is um, parapatry. Um, he proposed uh, what is known as the Wallace effect, commonly called these days uh, reinforcement, to explain how natural selection against hybrids between these diverging populations could contribute to reproductive isolation and lead to speciation. Darwin, in contrast, believed that speciation occurs largely as a result of competition in sympatry, so where the populations are together in the same habitat, uh, a theory he called his principle of divergence. So given that it is now thought that most speciation is a consequence of geographical isolation, Wallace was therefore more correct about the origin of species than Darwin was. Interestingly, many think of sexual selection as being Darwin's theory, um, but Wallace's good genes argument to explain the evolution of sexual characteristics is regarded uh, by many today as more plausible than Darwin's belief that females choose mates for aesthetic reasons, simply because they're more beautiful. Wallace could never accept that simple animals such as butterflies could have a sense of beauty. Even the concept of warning coloration in animals, uh, like the two um, animals at the top, um, arrow poison frog and a coral snake, um, and um, the idea of the great American interchange where animals from South America moved into North America and vice versa, when the two previously isolated continents were joined together by islands, which today we call Central America about three million years ago were originally Wallace's ideas. So um, down here uh, in the bottom right, you can see the idea of the, the Great American Interchange where species that evolved um, in uh, the North, um, like elephants and um, horses moved down into South America when uh, the two continents became joined. And things like glyptodons, big armadillos, um, et cetera, uh, um, moved um, North into uh, North America. So who was Wallace and how did he come to discover what has been called arguably the most momentous idea ever to occur to human mind, i.e. evolution by natural selection? Wallace was born on the 8th of January 1823 to a downwardly mobile middle class English couple, Thomas Veer and Mary Ann Wallace. Wallace's father was a qualified solicitor, but he had never practiced and had been living off inherited wealth 
uh, which was dwindling. Wallace was born in um, Kensington Cottage near Usk. Um, you can see the cottage um, in the top uh, left as it was in Wallace's time and the bottom right as it is today. Um, this area at the time was part of England, um, but it is now part of Wales. But it, it's always been culturally part of Wales. Wallace's father had moved to the Usk area from London in an attempt to reduce living costs. When Wallace was five, he and his family relocated to Hartford, uh, which is north of London. And it was there at Hartford Grammar School uh, that he received his own, only formal education. In about 1835, Wallace's parents fell on very hard times and Alfred was forced to leave school in March 1837 when he was only 14 because uh, they could no longer afford the modest school fees. You can see that the school wasn't exactly a, a grand affair. It was basically one large room um, with younger kids at one end and older kids at the other, taught by several teachers. After spending a few months uh, with his brother John in London, Wallace got a job with his older brother William, who was a land surveyor. William's work at the time involved doing the surveys and valuations required for carrying out the Commutation of Tithes Act of 1836, and also for the enclosures of common land. Wallace and his brother would do such work for six and a half years, roaming all over the countryside of Southern England and Wales. Wallace was pretty skilled at uh, drawing, um, even when he was young. This is a sketch of Derbyshire, um, which he did during that time. In the autumn of 1841, the Wallace brothers moved to the Neath area of Wales. It's a paint of, uh, painting of Neath that um, Wallace's brother did. And it was there that several key events in Alfred's early life took place. To give you an idea of the work they were doing, and this is one of the maps uh, Wallace made of the parish called uh, Lantwit Juxtony. And he would have had to carry his surveying chains and various other um, instruments around every single one of these fields, mapping the borders um, absolutely precisely. Whilst living near Neath in 1841, uh, that Wallace's interest in natural history uh, really began. It started because he wanted to be able to identify the plants he saw in the countryside whilst out surveying. He bought his first books on how to identify them and also began to collect them, forming a collection of press specimens. In his autobiography, um, imaginatively called My Life, uh, he explains how this happened. So he says, during the larger portion of my residence at Neath, we had very little to do and my brother was often away. I was thus left a good deal to my own devices and having no friends of my own age, I occupied myself with various pursuits in which I had begun to take an interest. What delighted me chiefly and became more and more the solace and delight of my lonely rambles among the moors and the mountains was my first introduction to the variety, the beauty and mystery of nature as manifested in the vegetable kingdom. I soon found that by merely identifying the plants I found in my walks, I lost much time in gathering the same species several times, and even then not being always quite sure that I'd found the same plant before. I therefore began to form a herbarium, collecting good specimens and drying them carefully between drying papers and a couple of boards weighed down by books of stones. My brother, however, did not approve of my devotion to this study, even though I had absolutely nothing else to do, uh, nor did he suggest any way in which I could employ my leisure time more profitably. Neither he nor I could foresee that it would have any effect on my future life, and I myself only looked upon it as an intensely interesting occupation for time that would other be, otherwise be wasted. Even when uh, we were busy, I had some days perfectly free and used to then take long walks over the mountains with my collecting box, which I brought home full of treasures. I first named the species as nearly as I could and then laid them out to be pressed and dried. At such times, I experienced the joy which every discovery of a new form of life gives to the lover of nature. 
almost equal to those raptures which I afterwards felt at every capture of new butterflies on the Amazon, or at the constant stream of new species of birds, beetles, and butterflies in Borneo, the Moluccas, and the Aru Islands. In December 1843, paid land surveying work became scarce. So Williams suggested that Alfred should try and get um, another job. And early uh, the next year, Wallace obtained a position teaching junior classes in English surveying and elementary drawing at um, the collegiate school in Leicester. Leicester had a good library and Wallace was able to study several important works on natural history um, and travel as well as, crucially as we'll see, Malthus's book called Principle of Populations, which he said he had, he had greatly admired for its masterly summary of facts and logical induction to conclusions. It was here um, in this library that he first met amateur naturalist Henry Walter Bates, who soon got um, Wallace passionate about collecting and studying beetles. And this is Bates um, to the right in old age. Wallace was amazed by their many strange forms and often beautiful markings of coloring. And the fact that about a thousand species could be found within only 10 miles of the town. In March 1845, Wallace's brother William died unexpectedly from a chest infection. And at Easter, Wallace quit his teaching job and moved back to Neath with his brother John in order to wind up William's affairs and continue the surveying business. Um, however, he soon found that running a business, even with the help of John, involved responsibilities such as fee collecting, collecting which he hated. Fortunately, however, he still enough, had enough free time to continue with his natural history related activities. And he also kept up a correspondence with his friend Bates. Whilst living in um, Neath, Alfred and John had some architectural and building work, which included designing uh, the Mechanics Institute building there. Uh, it was completed in 1847 and officially opened in 1848. Uh, despite experiencing a severe fire in 1903, um, it still exists, as you can see. It was in Neath in 1845 that Wallace first read Robert Chambers's controversial book called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, which had been published anonymously the year before. So this is the um, frontispiece of the book, and this is uh, Robert Chambers. This book was extremely popular at the time. Apparently, Prince Albert, Albert uh, used to read it out loud in daily installments to the young Queen Victoria. I wonder if she was amused. Although not a scientific work, vestiges convinced Wallace of the reality of evolution, uh, then called transmutation. Um, and in a letter to Bates dated December 1845, he remarked, I have rather a more favorable opinion of the vestiges than you appear to have. I do not consider it as a hasty generalization, but rather as an ingenious hypothesis, strongly supported by some striking striking facts and analogies, but which remains to be proved by more facts and the additional light which future researches may throw upon the subject. It at all events furnishes a subject for which every observer of nature had to turn his attention to. Every fact he observes must uh, make either for or against it. And it thus furnishes both an incitement to the collection of facts and an object to which to apply them when collected. A year or two after he wrote this, he was inspired by um, William Henry Edwards's book called A Voyage Up the River Amazon. And in late 1847 or early 48, he suggested to Bates that they go to the Amazon to collect specimens of insects, birds, and other animals for their private collections, selling um, duplicates to collectors and museums in order to fund the trip. The primary aim of the expedition, as far as Wallace was concerned, was to seek ev evidence for evolution and attempt to discover how it worked. In a letter to Bates written around this time, he says, 
I begin to feel rather dissatisfied with the mere local collection than it is to be learnt by it. I should like to take some one family to study thoroughly, principally with a view to the theory of the origin of species. By that means, I am strongly of opinion that some definite resu results might be arrived at. Bates evidently liked the idea of a tropical collecting trip, and the two young men, Wallace was um, 25 and Bates 23, set off by ship from Liverpool to Pará, now called Belém, um, in April 1848. At first they worked as a team, but after a few months they apparently quarrelled and split up to collect in different areas. Uh, this is a woodcut from Bates's famous book that he wrote about his trip, and this shows him being attacked by Arakari birds. He shot one of them, and the rest of the flock then came down to attack him. Uh, Wallace primarily collected butterflies and birds, um, two of which you can see here. So you can see collected by A.R. Wallace. This is his own collecting label that he used to put on every specimen. And it has um, the, the year, the species identification, and the locality, in this case, Pará. Wallace centered his activities in the middle Amazon and Rio Negro, you can see marked in red here, uh, journeying up uh, the Rio Negro further than any other Westerner had up to that point. Using the skills that he learned when he was a land surveyor, he produced the first detailed map of uh, this river and its tributaries. It was published by the Royal Geographical Society in London when he returned home and proved accurate enough to become the standard map for many decades. You can see a little section of uh, his original manuscript map that he drew, uh, which is actually huge. It's about, I don't know, three or four foot long. And then the, uh, the Royal Geographical Society um, redrew it and published it as a much smaller version, um, uh, along with a, a paper about uh, the river from, uh, by Wallace. And then they used to sell the map separately um, to people who wanted it. In fact, up till about 20 years ago, they still had a uh, un unsold stock of the map, so I managed to buy one from them. So um, by early 1852, Wallace was in poor health and in no condition to continue traveling. He decided to return to England and became, began the long trip back down the Rio Negro and Amazon to Barra. Passing through Barra, which is now Manaus, Wallace found to his uh, dismay that most of the specimens he had been sending downriver um, from the previous two years of his collecting, um, to, he sent them downriver and expected them to be shipped on um, to England. Um, but they had been delayed by officials in Manaus because the officials suspected that the boxes might con um, contain contraband. After satisfying them that they didn't, he collected the six large cases and set off for Britain on the sailing brig Helen um, on July 12th. Tragically, 26 days into the voyage, his ship caught fire and sank, taking with it all the specimens he had collecting, collected during the last two years, plus his collection of live animals and most of his field notes. All he managed to rescue was a tin box containing a few shirts into which he quickly put his watch, some money, drawings he made of fishes and palms, plus some notes and observations of the Rio uh, Negro and Vapes. These are some of his um, beautiful uh, drawings that he actually managed to rescue of fish and uh, palms. Uh, Wallace and the crew struggled to survive in a pair of badly leaking lifeboats. And very, very luckily, after 10 days drifting on the open sea, they were picked up by a passing cargo ship uh, making its way back to England. After a slow and harrowing journey, uh, during which time they um, ran out of food and the ship nearly sunk, they landed a deal in England um, on the 1st of November, 1852. Luckily, Wallace's agent in London, Samuel Stevens, um, had had the foresight uh, to ensure Wallace's collections for 200 pounds. Wallace estimated that they had been worth 500 pounds, but it was certainly um, a lot better than nothing. In the year after his return, Wallace was very busy writing two books, one on the palm trees of the Amazon and their uses, and another one about his travels, 
which he had to largely write from memory since most of his notes had been destroyed. He also published an important paper on the monkeys of the Amazon, in which he noted that big rivers were barriers to monkey species. One species was found on one bank of the river and the closely related species um, on the other bank. This seemed to Wallace to run against the idea of special creation by God. After all, why would God have bothered to create similar but different species on the opposite banks of a river? Wallace's river Rhine barrier hypothesis, as it's called, is still a topic of research today, and I fairly regularly see papers um, about it. Shortly after returning to England, Wallace had vowed never to travel on a boat at sea again, but good resolutions soon fade, and about a year later, in March 1854, he left Britain on a collecting expedition to what he called the Malay Archipelago. The area is now um, Singapore, Malaysia, East Timor, and Indonesia. So um, as I haven't got a, a cursor which you can see, uh, if you look towards the top uh, left of the map, um, you can see the bottom of the Malay Peninsula and the island of Singapore. And then to its uh, right, there's the huge island of Borneo. And then further right, there's what's called Celebes here, but that's now known as Sulawesi. And then far in the, um, the far right, there's uh, the uh, western end of the huge island of New Guinea. And all these black lines that you can see um, are actually Wallace's journeys that he made. So he went all over the place. He spent nearly eight years in the region, undertaking 60 or 70 separate journeys and visiting every major island at least once, resulting in a, a total um, of around 14,000 miles of travel. Wallace wrote that, the main object of my journeys was to obtain specimens of natural history, both for my private collection and to supply duplicates to museums and amateurs. Uh, so here's Wallace as he would have looked um, in the field um, with two uh, birds of, um, King Birds of Paradise on the table in front of him. Unlike the Amazon, his trip to Southeast Asia was a re resounding success, and he and his paid assistants collected almost 110,000 insect specimens, 7,500 shells, 8,050 bird skins, and 410 mammal and reptile specimens. Uh, Wallace personally collected more than half of them, i.e. he collected nearly all of the insects. He focused on the delicate specimens, um, whilst his assistants collected most of the vertebrates, like birds. Wallace's huge collection included about 5,000 species new to science, and he personally named 295 of the species um, in 21 scientific articles. Around 200 of the others were named after him by naturalists, usually as um, Wallacey. So Semioptera Wallacey is um, the scientific name of the Wallace's standard winged bird of paradise, for example. So here are just a few of the specimens he collected. In this um, drawer, you can see uh, mainly moths, including in the center, uh, one of the world's biggest moths, the um, Atlas moth. So the male at the top and the male, a female below. Um, a variety of insects, including uh, one of the world's biggest um, bush crickets or katydids, as you call them in the United States, uh, which is sort of uh, at the top of the drawer there. Um, that's really big. It's um, about, I don't know, seven inches across. And uh, a specimen of a, a hornbill. Uh, you can see Wallace's distinctive specimen label. And you can see this label has got a red mark at the top. That means that um, it's destined for his private collection, not to be sold by Stevens. So when Stevens um, received the specimens, he kept all the marked ones for Wallace. And these are two of the most iconic animal species he discovered. Wallace's golden bird wing butterfly from the Malaccas, which has got about a seven inch wingspan and Wallace thought was one of the most beautiful butterflies in the world. And Wallace's standard wing bird of paradise, um, which um, 
was the only bird of paradise he actually discovered. And he also found that um, in the Moluccas, which was far out of the known range of birds of paradise. And here are little bits of some of the notebooks he kept during the trip. So the notebook on the uh, left shows beetle wings that he stuck in to try and identify beetles to family using their wing veins. And uh, two on the right are notes he made on birds, um, which he and his assistants shot, uh, noting the eye color and beak color, because those things, obviously the eyes are lost when the spe uh, specimens are um, stuffed and the beak colors change as well. And these are some of his beautiful watercolor paintings, including uh, what's called Wallace's flying frog uh, in the middle. Sadly, he didn't um, say, managed to preserve a specimen of this um, for some reason, but it was the world's first gliding frog and he found it in Sarawak. And uh, he noted that uh, Chinese uh, workmen had um, insisted that he had seen it gliding down from a, a tall tree, um, you know, quite a, a few um, tens of meters. And Wallace noticed that the uh, membranes between its toes were much, much bigger than any other known frog. Um, and he published a, an account of it in his book, uh, The Malay Archipelago. But apparently um, people didn't really believe him for several decades until somebody else uh, found another specimen of the frog. We now come to the first of the three most important scientific articles which Wallace wrote during this trip. In February 1855, while staying in a tiny rest house owned by his friend, the ruler of Sarawak, Roger James Brooke, Wallace wrote what was to become one of the most important papers on evolution published by anyone prior to the discovery of natural selection. In his autobiography, Wallace recounts that it was written during the wet season while I was staying at a little house at the mouth of the Sarawak River at the foot of the Santa Bong Mountain. I was quite alone with one Malay boy as cook and during the evenings and wet days, I had nothing to do but look over my books and ponder over the problem which was rarely absent from my thoughts. Having always been interested in the geographical distribution of animals and plants, it occurred to me that these facts had never been properly utilized as indications of the way in which species have come into existence. The great work of Lyell, i.e. his famous book, Principles of Geology, had furnished me with the main features of the succession of species in time, i.e. in the geological record. And by combining the two, I thought that some valuable conclusions might be reached. I accordingly put my facts and ideas on paper, and the result, seeming to me of some importance, I sent to the Annals and Magazine of Natural History, which had appeared uh, in the following September, 1855. Its title was On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species, which law was briefly stated as follows. Every species has come into existence, coincident both in time and space, with a pre-existing closely allied species. This clearly pointed to some sort of evolution. It su suggested the when and the where of its occurrence, and that it could only be through natural generation, as was also suggested in the book Vestiges. But the how was still a secret, only penetrated some years later. He continues, soon after this article appears, Mr. Stevens, his agent, wrote to me that he had heard several naturalists expressing regret that I was theorizing, and what I had to do was collect more facts. After this, I had in a letter to Darwin expressed surprise that no notice had been taken um, of my paper, to which he replied that both Sir Charles Lyell and Mr. Edward Blythe, two very good men, specially called his attention to it. In fact, Wallace's Sarawak Law Paper, as it is called, impressed zoologist Edward Blythe so much that he wrote a long letter to Darwin about it. In it, he asked, what do you think of the paper in question? Has it at all unsettled your ideas regarding the persistence of species? Not perhaps so much from novelty of argument, but by the lucid collection of facts and phenomena. Although it hadn't unsettled Darwin, who unbeknown to Blythe was already a transmutationist, it certainly rattled Sir Charles Lyell, as it channel challenged his creationist views. 
In November 1855, soon after reading it, Lyle began writing a species notebook, in which he began to contemplate the possibility of evolutionary change for the first time. Only in 1867 would Wallace learn just how highly Lyle regarded his paper. Lyle wrote in a letter to Wallace, I've been reading over again your paper on the law which has regulated the introduction of new species, passive, passages of which I intend to quote, because there are some points laid out more clearly than I can find in the work of Darwin itself in regard to the bearing of the geological and zoological evidence on geographical distribution and the origin of species. Um, so this is uh, Down House in Kent, Darwin's house, which you can see far at the back there. Uh, on the right is, uh, on the left is uh, Darwin, one of Darwin's greenhouses, the only surviving one. Uh, the, the year after the Sarawak Law Paper was published in April 1856, Lyle paid a visit to Darwin at Down House and Darwin divulged his theory of natural selection to him, an idea which he had been working on more or less in secret for around 20 years. Soon afterwards, Lyle sent Darwin a letter urging him to publish the theory, at least someone beat him to it. He almost certainly had Wallace in mind. So in May 1856, Darwin, heeding this advice, began to write a sketch of his ideas for publication. Finding the sketch unsatisfactory, Darwin abandoned it in about October 1856 and instead began to write an extensive book on the subject, what's called his Big Species Book, uh, which was destined to not be published during well, uh, Darwin's lifetime, as we will see. In May 1856, about a, a year after he wrote his Sarawak Law paper, Wallace took a boat from Singapore to Lombok Island uh, now in Indonesia, and on the way they stopped for about two days on the neighbouring island of Bali, a fortuitous event which would lead to Wallace's second most important discovery of his trip. On Bali, Wallace found a similar species of bird, um, birds to the other islands he had visited to the west, including a weaver bird, a barbit, this is a barbit, in fact one of Wallace's specimens, a starling, Groups he had seen and collected in Borneo, Singapore, and Peninsular Malaysia. But then, and I quote, crossing over to Lombok, separated from Bali by a strait less than 20 miles wide, I naturally expected to meet with some of these birds again. But during my stay there of three months, I never saw one of them. Instead, Wallace found a completely different assortment, a yellow-crested cockatoo, like this one, a loud friar bird, and a peculiar megapod which uses its big feet to make very large mounds of dead leaves through which to incubate its eggs. None of the groups um, of birds to which these species belong were known on the western islands of Java, Sumatra, or Borneo. So here was a puzzle. Why were the bird faunas of two islands so close to one another so different? Wallace describes the mystery in a letter to his agent Stevens in August 1856, and he wrote, the islands of Bali and Lombok, though of nearly the same size of the same soil, aspects, elevation, and climate, and within sight of each other, yet differ considerably in their productions, and in fact belong to two quite distinct zoological provinces, in which they form the extreme limits. As an instance, I may uh, mention the cockatoos, a group of birds confined to Australia and the Malaccas, but quite unknown in Java, Borneo, Sumatra, and Malacca. One species, however, is abundant in Lombok, but it is unknown in Bali, the island of Lombok, forming the extreme western limit of its range and that of the whole family. Many other species illustrate this fact. Uh, the differences in the mammal faunas of the western and eastern islands were just as striking. On the large western islands, there were monkeys, tigers, and rhinos. But in Australia and nearby islands, there were no primates, cats, or ungulates. Most of the native mammals were marsupials, kangaroos, cuscus, and the like. So, um, as you can see from the central uh, map, uh, look at the island of Sulawesi there. Um, marsupials actually reach to Sulawesi. There's two species um, um, found there. 
but they don't cross over to Borneo and the islands of the other side. That line between, between Bali and Lombok signified something very profound to Wallace. He put his thoughts on paper again, publishing an article in 1857 entitled On the Natural History of the Aru Islands. Wallace explained that under Charles Lyell's centers of creation belief, one would expect to find similar animals in countries with similar climates and um, animals in, and dissimilar animals in countries with dissimilar climates. This was not a, at all what um, Wallace saw. For example, in comparing Borneo in the West um, with New Guinea in the East, New Guinea is the, you can see the Western tip of it um, uh, right to the, on the extreme right. Comparing those two islands, he observed that it would be difficult to point out two lands more exactly resembling each other in climate and physical features, but their birds and mammals were entirely different. Wallace reasoned further that some other law has regulated the distribution of the existing species. That law, Wallace suggested, was his Sarawak law that he uh, had proposed two years earlier. Again, Wallace used geology to make his case. He surmised that New Guinea, Australia, and Aru had been connected at some point in the relatively recent past, and so shared a similar set of birds and mammals. Similarly, he deduced that the Western Islands had once been part of Asia, and so shared the fauna of tropical Asia, uh, monkeys, tigers, etc. The islands of Bali and Lombok and Borneo and Sulawesi had never been connected, however, or only connected an extremely long time ago, because there was a, um, a deep oceanic trench between them. Wallace was correct. He had linked the question of the origin of species to how species were distributed, and he had defined a dividing line um, between the fauna of Asia and Australasia. His discovery would be forever known as the Wallace line, and because of uh, this and his later groundbreaking uh, books on animal distribution, Wallace is considered to be the founder of modern evolutionary biography, biogeography. For Wallace, the question then was not if species evolved, but how. In early 1858, while he was staying in a hut on the village, um, in the village of Dodinga, uh, the red mark um, towards the right is location of Dodinga, and Dodinga is on the huge and at that time largely unexplored. Indonesian island of Halmahira. Um, so while he was staying there in early 58, he at last discovered the elusive mechanism which he had been searching for during the last 10 years. In his book, Natural Selection and Tropical Nature, he recounts the story of his discovery. After writing the preceding paper, i.e. the Sarawak Law, the question of how changes of species could have been brought about was rarely out of my mind. But no satisfactory conclusion was reached until February 1858. At that time, I was suffering from a rather severe attack of intermittent fever, probably malaria. And one day, while lying on the bed during the cold fit, wrapped in blankets, the, thermom the thermometer was set at 88 degrees Fahrenheit. The problem again presented, presented itself to me, and something led me to think of the positive checks described by Malthus in his essay on population. The work I had read several years before which had made a deep and permanent impression on my mind. These checks, war, disease, famine and the like, must, it occurred to me, um, be much more effective in animals um, than in the case of man. And while pondering vaguely on this fact, there suddenly flashed upon me the idea of the survival of the fittest, that the individuals removed by these checks must on the, be, on the whole, inferior to those that survived. In the two hours that elapsed before my eighth fit was over, I had thought out almost the whole of the theory, and in the same evening I sketched the draft of my paper, and in the two succeeding evenings wrote it out in full, and sent it by the next post, uh, which was actually from the island of Ternate, um, which you can see on the left. So I sketched it out in full and sent it by the next post to Mr. Darwin. Wallace decided to send his essay to Darwin because he knew from correspondence that he was interested in the subject of species 
transmutation, as evolution is called. Although he had no idea that Darwin had already discovered the mechanism, he asked Darwin to show his essay to Lyle if he thought it was sufficiently novel and interesting, probably wanting to see Lyle's reaction to his new um, hypothesis, uh, which is his latest and most powerful challenge to Lyle's anti-evolutionary views. Uh, Wallace's letter to Darwin with the enclosed essay was posted from um, the small island of Ternate in March of 1858, and it almost certainly arrived um, at Darwin's house on the 18th of June, um, the same year, 1858. Uh, this is a, um, an old lithograph of Ternate. It's an active volcano, as you can see. The town is around the bottom. It's now quite a big city. When Darwin read Wallace's essay, he was understandably, understandably horrified and immediately wrote an anguished letter to Lyle asking for advice on what he should do. He exclaimed, I never saw a more striking coincidence. If Wallace had my manuscript sketch written out in 1842, he could not have made a better short abstract. So all my originality, whatever it may amount to, will be smashed. Darwin asked Lyle to contact another of their influential friends, botanist Joseph Hooker. And to cut a long story short, Lionel Hooker decided that the best course of action was to read Wallace's um, essay, along with two unpublished excerpts from Darwin's writings on the subject, to a meeting of the Linnaean Society of London on the 1st of July, 1858. Only 14 days after Wallace's essay had actually arrived in England. Darwin and Wallace's writings were published together in the Society's journal a few weeks later as a paper entitled On the Tendency of Species to Form Varieties and On the Perpetuation of Varieties and Species by Natural Means of Selection. Darwin's contributions were placed before Wallace's essay, probably to emphasize that he had thought of natural selection first. Wallace had said nothing about the publication of his essay in his letter to Darwin, and no attempt was made to get his permission to publish it. It would have taken quite some time to ask him and get a, re a reply. The mail time from Britain to uh, the Malay archipelago was about 70 days for a letter. Yeah, but what was the rush? Darwin had been sitting on the theory for 20 years, only telling two people about it. So yeah, perhaps uh, they were worried and uh, perhaps they were worried that Wallace um, would object if they asked him. Anyway, Wallace uh, later grumbled that his essay was printed without my knowledge, and of course without any correction of proofs, contradicting uh, Lyle and Hooker's fib in their introduction to it that both authors have unreservedly placed their papers in our hands. There's a widespread myth that the Darwin and Wallace paper generated very little interest after its publication. In fact, it received far more attention than would have been expected for a theoretical scientific article of its type. This is what Darwin expert um, Janet Brown wrote regarding the reaction to the paper. She said, during the next two or three months, it was reprinted either in full or in part in several popular natural history magazines of the day. A number of people made their views known in letters, reviews and journals. There were more notices than was usually assumed. For example, Richard Owen, the most revered naturalist of the time, mentioned the paper in his presidential address to the British Association for the Advancement of Science in September 1858, praising Wallace's explanation of the way species, um, of the way varieties replace one another, although hastily, hastily adding that there was no reason to think that this accounted for the origin of species. Soon after Darwin and Wallace's paper was read, Hooker uh, urged Darwin to publish his ideas on evolution in more detail um, in an academic journal. Darwin started to write but soon realized it would take an entire book to do it justice. He therefore ended up condensing what he had written in his big species book, uh, which was only half complete by them. And this abstract, as he would call it, was published 15 months later in November 1859 as is famous um, on the origin of species by means of natural selection, a book which Wallace greatly admired and magnanimous, magnanimously said would live as long as the Principia of Newton. And here's me with uh, Wallace's personal first edition 
um, of origin of species, which um, Darwin sent to him while Wallace was still out in the Malay archipelago. You can see um, on one of the front pages, Wallace has signed his name at the top. And below it says, from the author, which wasn't actually handwritten by uh, Darwin. The, the uh, writing is far too neat for Darwin. Uh, was sent by one of the, the scribes from Murray, the um, publishers. And uh, you can see below that it says Ricardo Spruce from A.R. Wallace, because Spruce actually presented this um, to uh, his very good friend, the botanist uh, Richard Spruce, uh, many years later. Uh, so as we have seen, Wallace was doubly responsible for the origin. The Sarawak um, essay was indirectly responsible for getting Darwin to start writing a book, and his Ternate essay spurred Darwin to rapidly condense the manuscript of that book and produce origin. Interestingly, we know that Wallace was writing notes for his own book on evolution when he was in the Malay archipelago, but he abandoned it when um, origin was published. It is vaguely possible that if his 1855 paper hadn't prompted Darwin to start writing a book, then Wallace may have beaten him to it. So Wallace had, uh, so Darwin had actually several lucky breaks. The luckiest of all being that Wallace sent his essay to him and not directly to a journal uh, for publication as he normally did. If Wallace had done that, then Darwin wouldn't have received any credit for the, uh, the theory at all, since science only gives credit for ideas which are actually published. In spite of the theory's traumatic birth, Darwin and Wallace developed a genuine admiration and respect for one another. Although, as Darwin once remarked in a letter to Wallace, they were, in one sense, rivals. Wallace frequently stressed that Darwin had a stronger claim to the idea of natural selection than um, he had himself. And as I mentioned previously, Wallace even named his really important um, 1889 book um, on evolution, uh, Darwinism. Wallace spent the rest of his long life developing and defending the theory of natural selection, as well as working on a very wide range of um, other sometimes highly controversial subjects. By the turn of the century, Wallace was probably Britain's best known naturalist. And by the time of his death in 1913, he was probably one of the world's most famous people with long obituaries appearing in the world's newspapers from Paris to Perth in Australia. So why, you may ask, do people who know something about the history of the theory of natural selection think that Darwin uh, first published the um, theory in origin? Why is Wallace remembered by relatively few people today? This is a tricky question because the explanation has to take into account that during Wallace's lifetime, he was widely acknowledged as being the theory, theory's co-discoverer. Um, in fact, natural selection was often called the Darwin-Wallace theory, and the highest possible honours um, of the UK were just bestowed on him for he, uh, his role as the co-discoverer. In fact, he, he received his first medal only 10 years after the publication of the Darwin-Wallace paper. Um, so he received many medals, including the, the Darwin-Wallace and Linnaean gold medal, medals, uh, this, in the center of the screen, you can see the uh, Linnaean Darwin Wallace Medal. Um, of, yeah, so the, the Darwin Wallace and Linnaean Gold Medals of the Linnaean Society of London, the Copley Darwin and Royal Medals of the Royal Society, um, and the Order of Merit, which you can see on the right, uh, which is awarded by the ruling monarch as the highest civilian honor of Great Britain. I like the note from the Royal Society on the left. And I think it's a bit ironic. It says, so I have the pleasure to inform you that the President and Council of the Royal Society have awarded to you the Darwin Medal for your independent origination of the theory of the origin of species by natural selection. It was only in the 20th century that Wallace's name faded into relative obscurity. And the best explanation I can think of to explain this is that in the late 19th and early 20th century, natural selection as an explanation for evolutionary change became very unpopular, with most biologists adopting alternative theories such as neo-Lamarckism, um, orthogenesis of the mu mutation theory, also called the hopeful monster theory, which said that basically new species could arise in a single mutation. So a, a mother might give birth to um, a new species. 
It was so different um, from the um, the popula population that the mother belonged to that uh, couldn't interbreed with it. Strangely enough, this actually does occur um, from time to time in plants. Primula cuensis being an example uh, where the, the seeds um, have um, doubled in chromosomes or something and can no longer cross with the ancestral species. But anyway, it's very rare. In fact, Wallace and the German biologist August Weissmann were the only prominent biologists who supported the theory of natural selection in the um, 1880s after Darwin's death, a period which historians often call the eclipse of Darwinism. It was only with the modern evolutionary synthesis of the 1930s and 40s that natural selection became generally accepted amongst biologists as the primary mechanism of evolutionary change. By then, however, the history of the discovery had been forgotten by many. There was a new generation of biologists. And when interest in the theory revived, many wrongly assumed that the idea had first been published in um, origin. Thanks to what's called the Darwin industry, recent decades, Darwin's fame has increased exponentially, eclipsing um, the important contributions of his contemporaries uh, like Wallace. So anyway, uh, that's the end of the main part of my talk. I would now like to briefly tell you how I ended up working full time on Wallace um, as the director of the Wallace Correspondence Project. Um, I first became interested in Wallace while I was working on my PhD in London's Natural History Museum in the early 1990s. I was um, actually studying the evolution of mimicry in a group of butterflies called Athamians from South and Central America. And that led me to become interested in theories that have been proposed to explain the evolution of animal coloration. And I soon found that a lot of these had been originally devised by Wallace and started to get interested in him and read up about him. In September uh, eight, uh, 1998, my wife-to-be and I decided to go camping on what's called the Isle of Purbeck in Dorset, uh, which was actually the first trip that um, Jan and I went on together. I remember reading uh, that Wallace had been buried not far from there in the town of Broadstone. So I convinced Jan to try and find the grave with me, all very romantic. We spent an hour or so wandering around the graveyard, but couldn't find it. On the way back out, we decided to walk around the back of some uh, huge conifer trees, and I discovered the grave monument, um, partly engulfed um, by one of them. You can see on the extreme left um, what it was like uh, originally. Uh, you can see that it's rather an unusual uh, monument for a grave, uh, with a seven foot tall, rather phallic looking uh, fossil tree trunk uh, sticking out, mounted on a block of perfect limestone. Um, and I'm sure the paleo paleobotanists among you uh, will no doubt recognize that the trunk is of Protocompressum nemoxylon perbeckensis from the Portland um, Swanage area of Dorset. Unfortunately, the monument was in a poor state of repair. And to cut a long story short, I contacted the Wallace family who owned the grave plot and decided with them to set up the Wallace Memorial Fund to raise money to restore the grave and extend the lease, which had only 14 years left to run. After which time the plot uh, would have been used for another burial. The fund was set up in January 1999, and after about a year, we raised about 7,000 pounds from people all over the world. The fund then paid for the conifer to be cut down, for um, the limestone base to be cleaned and repaired, and for a gray granite surround to be installed around the base to prevent weeds, and also for a bronze plaque uh, to be made, uh, which you can see there on the, the bottom right. Uh, the plaque briefly explains who Wallace was, as the original plaque was not very uh, informative. You can see that at the top of the screen. Uh, we also paid for the lease to be extended by 100 years, the new leaseholder being the Linnaean Society, where Darwin and Wallace's 1858 paper on natural selection was originally read. The restored monument was unveiled in April um, 2000. Anyway, as a result of this project, I got to know the Wallace family fairly well, especially um, his grandson, Dick, uh, who's actually still alive. He's, I think, 98 um, now. Uh, when I visited Dick's house, he showed me an amazing collection he still had of 
Wallace's manuscripts, books, and insect specimens. Then she asked whether um, he had considered selling or donating the collection to an institution like the Natural History Museum. And he said that um, indeed they had, they had uh, tried to contact, um, uh, tried to interest uh, Cambridge University Library uh, some years before, but they declined it since they were concentrating on their Darwin collection. Of course, famously, Cambridge University Library is the home of the Darwin Correspondence Project, which after 40 years of work um, is winding up its work uh, this year. Anyway, back in the museum, I managed to convince the library to buy the collection. And it is now the, the largest archive of Wallace documents, about uh, 6,000 owned by any organization. Because they are rare, valuable, and delicate, the documents are housed in the museum's rare books room and are difficult for scholars to access. I therefore came up with the idea of digitizing them and making them available on the internet. I applied for a three-year grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation in the USA um, to do this, and the Wallace Correspondence Project was born in October 2010. The project's remit expanded beyond the museum's collection to include all of Wallace manu ma Wallace's manuscripts in collections around the world. The project's aims were to locate, digitize, catalog, transcribe, interpret, and publish them, both on the web and in a series of um, printed volumes. I calculate that 11 volumes um, of about 600 pages each will be required. Here's the project's uh, website. And you'll note that um, David Attenborough and British comedian Bill Bailey um, are kindly uh, agreed to be the patrons. So far, the project has been running uh, with interruptions for seven and a half years. And uh, we have located lessons in 244 public and private collections uh, worldwide, plus in about 245 articles and books. Today, we have found 5,688 letters, of which 2,748 were written by Wallace and 2,159 sent to him. The remaining 781 are third party letters which pertain to Wallace, e.g., a letter from Spruce to Hooker explaining why Wallace and Bates um, split up when they were in the Amazon, which is actually one of them. Uh, the project was based at the museum for four and a half years, and I worked on it part time and supervised a full time um, archivist. When funding was beginning to run out, the John Templeton Foundation contacted me and suggested I might consider applying um, to them for the next grant. There was a problem, however, as my new boss didn't approve of me spending time working on the project when my job was supposed to be uh, the curator of the orthoptroid insect collection. Orthoptroids are cockroaches, um, katydids, grasshoppers, earwigs, stick insects, etc. Her face um, contorted into a grimace whenever I mentioned the word Wallace. I decided to seek advice from the head of department, and he said that the Wallace project was important to the museum, so I should go ahead and apply for a three-year grant, and he would convince my bosses uh, that I should continue work on it part-time. So I applied for the grant and got it. At half a million pounds, it was the largest grant I think any curator at the museum has ever been awarded. But then the trouble started. My boss and her boss were not at all happy and in the end, my managers told me that I had to give the money back and stop my work on the project. I couldn't accept that a project of such importance should end this way, and that my work of many years should be thrown away. So I ended resigning from the museum and taking the grant with me with their approval. I then had the very difficult task of finding a charity to host the grant. And after months of talking to various organizations, I spoke to Darwin's great-great-grandson, Randall Keynes, um, who I knew um, vaguely. Randall is the CEO of the charity, the Charles Darwin Trust, and he very kindly suggested that they would be prepared to manage the grant money. Um, Templeton agreed, and after a year of reworking the project proposal, finding an office, recruiting staff, etc., for phase two of the project, um, it finally began again in December 2017. During um, Three years of the grant, we achieved an enormous amount, producing draft transcriptions 
of every letter we have, plus a huge 543 page catalog uh, that lists all the metadata of the letters. A stipulation of the grant um, was to put our draft um, transcripts on the web. And the Darwin Correspondence Project at Cambridge University uh, came to the rescue. They'd been developing a sophisticated system called Absalom um, for Darwin's letters and those of other leading 19th century scientists. Our transcripts of Wallace letters have now been imported and are already being used by scholars. In fact, um, the world's um, best, I think, ever biography of Wallace is currently being written um, and uh, it's drawing heavily on um, our letters um, in Epsilon. Darwin did a huge favor for Wallace um, in securing a government pension for him when he, was in, with, when he was in financial trouble. And I would like to say a huge thank you to the Darwin Trust and Darwin Correspondence Project for continuing this friendly spirit by helping to preserve Wallace's legacy. I'm still currently trying to find funds to continue the project as there's still a huge amount we still have to do. Uh, so if you have any suggestions for possible funders, then please let me know. Initially, I'd like funds to employ myself and a researcher for two years to produce volume one of the correspondence. And this 600 page uh, volume would contain all his early letters from his childhood through his expeditions to the Amazon and Malay archipelago. Um, fortunately, I have um, some money to continue part-time work on, on the project, thanks to Sea Trek si sailing adventures uh, based in Bali in Indonesia. Um, and that allows me to survive while I search for um, additional funds. Talking of Sea Trek, um, this is their beautiful boat, the Ombak Puti, and I lecture on this boat about four times per year in order to um, uh, raise mon uh, money for the Wallace Correspondence Project. Um, Yombak Puti um, is uh, a hand-built um, ironwood hull made by the sea dyaks of Borneo with no nails at all holding it together. And it um, uh, was built originally as a Panisi trading schooner. As uh, Sea Trek bought the hull and then fitted um, mod, all mod cons into uh, all the cabins, etc., and fitted, you know, advanced um, satellite navigation and powerful engines, etc. So the Ombak Puti can use, um, well, it uses its engines most of the time, but it can use sails as well. So it's sort of like a modern, modernized um, Panisi say, um, schooner, uh, as used by the sea dikes of um, uh, the Malay archipelago. Uh, this is uh, on the Top left, you can see um, the sort of dining room and where I give my talks. And below that's the eating area um, at the front of the ship. And you can see the ship in the distance there as we go on one of my our expeditions to land, um, looking for birds of paradise and that sort of thing. So the, this is um, these are some of the things uh, that we see. So um, on my um, trips. Uh, which are called In Search of Wallace and His Living Treasures. They're two-week trips, uh, which I do twice a year. Um, we go on the, the route shown um, in the bottom left from Ternate Island all the way down the coast of Halmahira and then um, all the way across to uh, the west coast of New Guinea. And we see things like Birds of Paradise. These are actually my photos taken of Birds of Paradise on one of the trips. And in another trip, um, we go to Banda, the, the home of Nutmeg, which is in the, the middle of nowhere. And you can see the volcanic cone in the top left of um, one of the, the active volcanoes there. And we do a huge amount of snorkeling on um, literally some of the best uh, coral reefs left on the planet, far better condition uh, than the Great Barrier Reef, um, probably because uh, the coral reefs in Indonesia are around islands which go very very uh, the islands are often volcanic and go um, very deep down um, to the sea bed and there's constant upwellings of cool water um, keeping the reefs um, from overheating whereas in the Great Barrier Reef um, it's on a very shallow shelf 
And uh, when there's very hot uh, weather and El Nino events, etc., the water heats up and um, kills off the corals. The corals actually expel their symbiotic algae and then end up starving. So these are some of the things that I've actually photographed uh, on our trips, clownfish, uh, green turtle and manta rays, which were fantastic. Sadly, a number of trips have been cancelled, obviously due to the pandemic, but we hope they'll resume uh, later this year. And if you want to, would like to go on a trip, um, and it will be a trip of a lifetime, uh, and help the Wallace Correspondence Project, then please join me. Um, if you go to the um, URL at the bottom of this um, screen, tinyurl.com slash Wallace Cruises, it will take you to a page listing my trips. And note that next year is the 200th anniversary of Wallace's birth. So there couldn't be a, a better time to follow in his footsteps. So, well, that's the end of my talk. Um, thanks very much for listening. And I will be happy to take questions now. George, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful presentation and for highlighting all of the wonderful work uh, that Wallace has done in his own lifetime and to inform our modern world as well. Um, I, I um, am, uh, you know, of course, deeply enamored by uh, Wallace and many 19th century um, uh, uh, naturalists. Um, we have uh, several uh, questions for you. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask if anyone has a question to please put it in the chat. But I have three questions here and I hope you'll have time to answer them. Yeah, sure. How important were Windsor Earl's publications for Wallace's findings regarding biogeography in the Malay archipelago? Hi. Okay. So yeah, yeah that was the... The, the chat that I was, um, th I'm thinking of, um, there was a, a, uh, an earlier paper uh, that um, vaguely pointed out that, uh, you know, the relations um, on either side of the Wallace line, but it was just um, an incidental um, mention um, in an otherwise paper on a, you know, focusing on a different area. And certainly um, the person who wrote it, if it was Earl or someone earlier, um, was certainly not an evolutionist and didn't realize mm -hmm. the significance um, of you know the sets of animals being different and having different evolutionary histories on the two sides of the line. I see. Thank you. Uh, you know, there are so many people you can go back in time. You could look at von Humboldt's work. Um, you know, where you draw the line, of course, I think many of the 19th century, great 19th century uh, naturalists really did depend on Lyell's work. Uh, for a justification for the length of time it would take for species uh, to mutate or speciate or to go extinct for that matter. Um, and uh, I, I'm glad that you spent a, a, some time talking about uh, Lyell in particular. Yeah, um, well, um, you mentioned Humboldt, but um, yeah. he, he, was, um, he was obviously not an evolutionist. Um, right. And as I've uh, said, sort of uh, parodying a, a well-known um, sort of phrase. Um, nothing in bio, bio, nothing in biogeography makes sense except in the light of evolution. Mm -hmm. If you don't know about the relations between species and the fact that they are, you know, historically related, um, the biogeographical patterns just don't make sense. Um, so, whereas Humboldt did, you know, very good work with plant zonation on mountains, etc., uh, he wouldn't have been able to you know, do the sort of thing that um, Wallace, Darwin, and later evolutionists could do. In right. Sense. Right. Because, you know, Humboldt is writing 75 years earlier than, you know, the, these uh, great naturalists of the 19th century. Um, mm -hmm. So the next question, um, did Wallace's interest in support of spiritualism detract from his scientific theories? Um, Actually... Um, actually, no, this is a, a misconception. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there were slight grumbles from um, Darwin and uh, Hooker, uh, mainly, um, about it. But 
if you read their letters, um, they're not bitching about Wallace's spiritualism at all. And they basically, a lot of scientists at the time were spiritualists. And it mm -hmm. was a crazed kind of sweeping Victorian side, uh, society. And the fact is that at that point, science and religion really hadn't separated. Um, they were in the process of separating. And um, Wallace was um, very careful in keeping uh, his spiritualism out of um, his evolutionary uh, writings. So his spiritualism began because he couldn't under understand how the human brain could be capable of so much when evolution said that it, um, you know, natural selection only acted at the moment. And so how could a, an organ like the brain that had so much more abilities uh, than what ev evolution des designed it for, how could it exist? And that sort of set him on the slippery road to spiritualism. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, um, you know, all the other amazing theories um, that he developed um, uh, and his work on um, natural selection and speciation, etc. you know, um, spiritualism wasn't brought into it. And strangely enough, his version of spiritualism is very different to what people think of today as spiritualism. Uh, someone has called uh, Wallace's spiritualism scientific naturalistic spiritualism because he actually believed that the spirit world was part of the natural world and that you could scientifically study it um, and that there was interaction between the, the natural world and the spirit world. And this is an idea which I don't believe any of the modern spiritualists um, uh, accept. But it's always actually really annoyed me that people always hark on about Wallace's spiritualism uh, when um, if he had been a Christian like Darwin was for a lot of his life, uh, that wouldn't have been remarked on. It's just because Christianity, the mumbo jumbo of Christianity is seen as, is normalized by our society and people don't think, oh dear, you know, that guy is a nutter. As if he, you know, he's a Christian. Um, it is possible for scientists to do um, very good work, um, even if they have strange um, sort of beliefs in the mm -hmm. supernatural. Um, because after all, science isn't a belief system. It's a method of um, investigating uh, the natural world. Okay, Richard. Uh, this is just to calls up this wonderful letter I held in my hand once from Hooker uh, to Darwin saying, um, now, uh, the, on the mention of a pension for Wallace, a government pension for his contributions to natural history, I don't know if I can ask my friends in government uh, to endorse this because uh, he uh, is a leading and public spiritualist. That's a quote. And uh, so he, he wonders what, what to do. What shall I write? How shall I reply to this? He asks Huxley and Huxley returns a beautiful note to him and says, why don't you just tell them that um, whatever uh, Wallace's superstitions may be, he's entitled to them and they are no worse than the superstitions of the majority of the country. That's it, that's all I've got. Thank, thank you for- uh, Thanks, thank Richard. You for uh, uh, okay, um, let me just move on to, um, I, I think we're gonna run out of time before we get to all of the questions and I see that uh, Larry's hand is up, Larry Shaw's hand is up as well. But uh, this question comes from uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors of the um, program today. And the question is, uh, were Wallace and Darwin's theories really identical? Um, and this is uh, from uh, Lawrence Millander. Um, I read that uh, Wallace did not accept mutations um, as truly random uh, uh, or, bene or be but beneficial. Uh, did he think evolution had a goal other than adapting fitness uh, to conditions? Um, absolutely not. Um, he stressed many times very, very clearly that um, uh, evolution adapted um, uh, organisms to their immediate conditions. And that's why, as I mentioned before, he had a problem with uh, the human brain. So how could people, you know, living in New Guinea uh, with, you know, no complex technology and uh, mathematics, etc. How come they've got a brain the same as ours? Um, how 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 come the brain has evolved to have greater functionality than it actually needs? And that's, as I said, what 
what um, put him on the slippery slope to spiritualism. But um, he had a, a very modern um, idea of natural selection. But of course, it's quite difficult to, uh, you know, there's natural selection, which is the core of evolutionary theory. And um, that's got several simple elements. There must be variation and conditions um, change and that there's a struggle for existence. And then um, the fittest survive, pass their genes on to the next generation. That core theory was identical um, in both Wallace's and Darwin's um, formulations in the 1858 paper. But what was different um, were um, Darwin's um, Lamarckis, um, Lamarckian beliefs. Um, he wasn't a pure natural selection. Even in Origin of Species, he has a whole chapter discussing the evolution of acquired characteristics. And he invented uh, the disproved theory of um, pangene pangenesis um, to explain it. Um, but also Darwin um, proposed sexual selection in, in the original joint paper. Um, but that was a very different version of natural of sexual selection to today's natural selection, uh, today's sexual selection. And bizarrely, today's sexual selection, as I mentioned in my, uh, my talk, is more Wallacean than it is Darwinian. Um, so, yeah, but people still think sexual selection, Darwin's theory, but Wallace's ideas, alternative ideas, because that was something that they always disagreed on, um, sexual selection. So they um, sort of um, had various disagreements about the add-on bits to you know evolutionary theory. Um, and um, sometimes Darwin was right and sometimes Wallace was right. Um, okay. And yeah. Now, here's a question I have. It's understandable that when a genetic trait comes, uh, change gives an animal advantage, it will reproduce itself. But why does that mean that ones that don't have that advantage die out? For example, let's take the praying mantis. A little mantis was a carnivore and it was doing quite well, surviving. And one day uh, there was a defective mantis born and it had serrated edges on its forelegs. And this gave it a, actually gave it an advantage at capturing prey. So it's understandable why that little mantis would do quite well. But why would that mean that the other mantises over generations would disappear? Um, it's all to do with probability of survival of traits over time. And you can do simple mathematical models to show that even a tiny selective advantage um, sweeps through the population um, in a very short space of time. So if the gene uh, that confers the serrations to the mantid's uh, forelegs give it just a slightly higher chance of keeping hold of prey and um, the prey not escaping, um, it will mean that that mantis lineage has a slightly higher probability of surviving and passing on more of its genes to the next generation. And the advantage just has to be really small, as I said. Um, and if you model it, you'll see that that trait will then spread throughout the population and eliminate, replace the ancestral uh, trait. Yeah, I mean, we're really talking about uh, concepts of uh, gene flow and genetic drift at this point. And I recommend looking, looking these topics up because they help to inform how exactly genes, favorable genes pass through a generation and disfavorable genes, depending on the ecology for a species, may not pass themselves on. But before I ask this last question, I would ask everyone in the audience to uh, definitely look at the uh, Wallace Correspondence Project and um, think seriously of uh, donating uh, to it uh, to support George uh, and all the very fine work that uh, he's done um, and continues to do. Um, and uh, I applaud him very, very much and, and everybody. But here's the last question. It's very interesting. Um, Thanks, so, oh, sure. Um, um, so um, I'm just going to read it. Uh, several years ago, a chest was found in an antique store in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, dear. I know this story. Oh, OK. So, you know, it was yeah. apparently on NPR and it apparently was Alfred Russell Wallace's chest or was it not? Um, no, it definitely wasn't. The owner of uh, this cabinet of specimens um, contacted me um, when he was trying to um, think about selling it. 
And I realized very quickly that it wasn't Wallace's um, uh, specimens, but he managed to convince somebody at the American Museum of Natural History uh, who wasn't an entomologist, um, who didn't know very much about the history of Wallace's specimens, which I've studied extensively. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the guy at the American AM and H um, believed that it was Wallace's, and um, they contacted um, your National Research Council, who made this glowing video about the thing and how it was a national treasure. And um, anyway, then this guy, the owner, uh, managed to flog it through auction um, for an undisclosed but huge sum of money. Uh, and it ended up in an Arab country um, where it's sitting in a warehouse now. And the Arabs are trying to get their money back once they realize that it wasn't um, Wallace's collection. So, so they and, had been defrauded, basically, by someone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying I, I actually got lots of very rude um, uh, emails from the person who owned the collection when I pointed out that there was absolutely no, no shred of evidence that it was Wallace's. And another Wallace expert, independently of me, in fact, two others, um, who knows who know about Wallace's um, specimens, um, reached independently the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was legally okay. threatened, and um, yeah, it all got very nasty. Well, okay, so again, we know that you're real. We know that the Wallace Correspondence Project <laughs> is a very important scholarly uh, authority. And uh, please, again, um, think uh, everyone in the audience, we have about 100 people here uh, to uh, please um, uh, think about contributing to uh, this wonderful organization. Um, because as we know, history continues forward um, and we don't want to forget or lose the important work. Uh, you know, memory is everything when it comes to this. And um, if we are going to have a continued modernity, um, a reality based on evidence and science and um, uh, the good work of naturalists, um, both during Darwin's time, we haven't talked about T.H. Huxley, we haven't talked in depth about Joseph Hooker, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, everything is a building block uh, in evolution <laughs> and, and in this and in understanding in the history of science. So, uh, George, thank you again. Um, we appreciate it. And I thank everyone for coming again. Um, um, uh, CFI New York, New York City Atheist. Thank you for co-sponsoring today. Um, I welcome you, us to continue the conversation. Uh, if you'd like, uh, again, through emailing me. And um, thank you for coming today and uh, wish everybody a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.